all of you. On behalf of CIPLA, I welcome you all in this interesting Prolation web series episode two. So uh, today, uh, Dr. Felix Rosno will discuss about the international clinician perspective on Trevaracetam. So, uh, so today we have uh, uh, this um, eminent speaker and moderator, uh, one uh, Professor Dr. Felix uh, Rosino as a speaker and Dr. Joy Desai as a moderator. Yeah. So, uh, Dr. Joy Desai is a director and head uh, in Department of Neurology in the Just Look Hospital and Research Center in Mumbai. Uh, he's a consultant neurologist in uh, Sir H. N. Uh, Revised Hospital in Mumbai. Also, uh, Sir has a DNB teacher for the neurology at Just Look Hospital in Mumbai. Uh, Sir is a life member of uh, Indian Epilepsy Association, then Indian uh, Epilepsy Society, and Indian Academy of Neurology. Also, the corresponding member of the um, American uh, American Epilepsy Society. Uh, Sir has a various publication which include the 28 peer review articles and six book chapters. Uh, also, present is a numerous presentation on national and international forum and interest in epilepsy, sleep, uh, neurodegeneration tracking, and the photography. So uh, with this introduction, a very warm welcome to you, sir. So, uh, so now I would like to hand over to uh, Dr. Chai Desai, sir, for the further uh, process. Yeah, over to you, uh, Dr. Desai. Right. Thank you, Preeti. And uh, thank you for asking me to be here. I actually, I'm here today on behalf of Dr. Sangeeta Rawat, my colleague who was supposed to moderate this session. But unfortunately, in the COVID pandemics, Dr. Sangeeta is not well. She's down with COVID herself and she's in the hospital. She requested me to actually stand in for her. Uh, our, um, but she's going to be fine. She's, uh, she's doing well. Uh, the international uh, clinician's perspective on Brivarasatam is the subject that Professor Rosno is going to talk to us about today. You have heard uh, about Brivarasatam and we know that it's taken the pharmaceutical industry by storm and neurologists are coming to grip with it's uh, key tenets and how it can be applied in clinical practice. Uh, it's my honor to introduce Professor Rosno to you. And um, Professor Felix Rosno is the director of the Epilepsy Center of Frankfurt, uh, the Center of Neurology and Neurosurgery at the University Hospital at Frankfurt. He's been, uh, uh, he's a speaker at the Center for Personalized Translational Epilepsy Research at the Goethe University, Frankfurt, Germany. He started medicine at the Free University of Berlin, did his doctoral research grant from the Max Planck Institute of Neurological Research in Cologne, and subsequently an MD from the University of Cologne, where he was also trained as a board certified neurologist. So he has a vast experience in epileptology and uh, anti-epileptic medications. And it's in, we are indeed fortunate to have him amongst us today. And he shall talk to us about his perspective and prepare us a time, and I will not hold you away from him for long. Uh, Dr. Rosano, it's all yours. Thank you very much. I will thank you, Dr. Desai, for the kind introduction. I'm glad to be able to be with you today, dear colleagues. I was asked to talk a little bit about Rivarastatam, the post-marketing use and my personal experience because we've been having it in Germany since 2015 and we have gained some experience. I have a couple of conflicts of interest. Um, they are, some are related to pharmaceutical industry, including UCB Pharma, which also um, supports this um, event today. I have some grant support from different sources that you can see here. This is the logo for our Center for Personalized Translational Epilepsy Research, which is one of the major sources of third party money. Just to inform you where we are right now, um, or where I am, you are obviously in India, but this is the Frankfurt Airport, Frankfurt International Airport, which is used um, a lot by people from India, especially when they travel to the United States. This is a golf course nearby. This is our soccer arena where the Frankfurt Eintracht plays. Um, and this is the epilepsy center near to the river Main, which will later on go into the Rhine. So you have an idea. Um, so I will do it this way, a little bit of preclinical and clinical profile, just one slide results from the um, randomized controlled trials, some, some a little bit on adverse events. Then we talk about the remaining questions and how they can be answered from post-marketing papers. Um, and then a little bit on patients in special groups, uh, which we have already some experience with. So this is the, the, the list of anti-epileptic drugs and their approval over time, starting 1860 with bromide 
Then you come to these ones, the classical ones, and every one, every drug that is here in red is approved for monotherapy. As you can see, brivaracetam is not yet approved for monotherapy, but it's one of the latest. Now we have kind of bidiol and fenfluramine and epidiolex, and there's also cenobamide coming, but brivaracetam is still recent and new. This is this uh, chemical structure. It's been um, effective at show effectivity in the a multi, uh, um, 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 electroshock model and the, um, um, pe pe um, in the PTZ model. Um, there's strong seizure suppression in vivo in animal models of focal and generalized epilepsy. And um, um, there's epileptiform activity in um, models of drug resistant, anti seizure drug resistant um, animals. There's strong affinity. Um, 15 to 30 times as, as strong um, and, and quite selectively to the SV2A protein. So to the synaptic vesicle, vesicle protein 2A. Um, there's no effect on other targets that also separates it a little bit from levetiracetam, which has a little bit of sodium channel and um, calcium channel and amper receptor, receptor um, affinity. Brivaracetam does not. It enters the brain rapidly and actually much more rapidly as compared to levetiracetam. And there's some clinical trials on photo um, um, paroxysmal response that shows you that this is suppressed by IV um, um, rivaracetam faster than by IV levetiracetam. This um, brings or sums up the, uh, the trials that, that were um, uh, controlled and prospective and that led to the approval um, of rivaracetam to the market as an add-on anti-epileptic drug for focal epilepsy with and without generalized seizures. And you see the color is always um, one trial. So for instance, yellow is one trial, it's the NO1193. And you see placebo, rivaracetam 20 milligrams and 50. See that there's a nice um, staircase of response, which you kind of want. Then interestingly, there was a study um, where Professor Revelin was the first author down here in 2014, which didn't show much of a response, probably some um, methodological problems. Then there are other studies done here, for instance, the NO1358, where you see again a response much different from placebo. And then there's this green one again, 50 milligrams were quite good and 150 were also effic efficacious. So in the end, this led to the approval of brivaracetam as a drug for focal epilepsy. Maybe also of interest, um, the rate of 100% responders for secondarily generalized tonic-clonic seizures. You know that the secondary generalized tonic-clonic seizure is the main predictor of um, sudden unexpected death in epilepsy patients. The more of those you have, the more likely you are to die if you have more than one a month then you have a um, 14 times higher um, likelihood to die of ZUDEP as compared to people who don't have any general stomach clonic seizure. So it's important to suppress these. And you can see that in a dose-related fashion, um, rivaracetam seems to suppress general stomach clonic seizures up to 42% in the high-dose arm. So is it protective against ZUDEP? It might be because if it suppresses tonic clonic seizures um, effectively, um, the, the likelihood of ZUDEP will go down. Now, what are the side effects? Always important. We always explain to our patients before we start a drug what might happen on the adverse event side. And you see here, um, the more frequent ones are marked in red and the dose-related ones are marked in red. And somnolence is one, goes a little bit up between 50 and um, 200. Um, it's also quite frequent under placebo. Vertigo goes a little bit up. Headache, not so important. It's also quite frequent in placebo. It goes down with higher doses, so probably not related. Fatigue goes up in a somewhat dose-related manner, 3.7 under placebo, 11.6 under BRIF 200 a day. Nausea, not too much to see, a little bit higher than placebo, but not, not really dose-related. Irritability, which is a psychobehavioral side effect we know from levetiracetam, can also occur with rivaracetam. So that needs to be um, told to the patient and looked after. Then let's look what kind of interaction potentials do anti-seizure medications have. And this is a whole list. And whenever you see a plus, it's an enzyme inducer or an enzyme inhibitor. Um, classic inhibitor is valproic acid, depakine, as you know. 
And brivirostatum has a minimal um, enzyme inducing and enzyme inhibiting um, power. And there's some drugs that have, don't have any. So in that respect, brivirostatum not clinically relevant, but there is some interaction potential. Um, and the main, maybe the one thing, if you use carbamazepin a lot, um, brivirostatum can bring up the carbamazepin epoxide level. And that might be something that causes side effects. Okay, what about the approval in Europe? It was approved on 15th of February, 2015 as an add-on medication in focal epilepsy. Um, initially it was, I think, at, for, from the age of 16 and above, now it's age four and above. Um, it's available as tablets and as quite frequently is the case with UCB, it's also has been available as an IV solution quite early on um, and um, as a, also as a PO solution. So. For kids, you can have it as a solution. Kids age four and above probably like don't like to eat tablets. They have it easier to take a solution. There's now uncontrolled post-marketing data. So that's uncontrolled, but I will report on in generalized epilepsies and status epilepticus. Some on the switch of levetiracetam to brivaracetam. And there's some data on the plico behavioral adverse event profile comparing these three substances. And um, so with Levetiracetam with Prampanel and with Toparamate. So what, are, what kind of questions are remaining after the, after the RCTs? What, what can we learn from everyday clinical use? There are some post-marketing studies which I would like to um, show you to. Um, I think Germany was probably the first market where it was used. And so people were motivated to report their um, post-marketing experience early on. The first paper was this one from Bernhard Steinhoff um, and his group from the Epilepsy Center in Cork, which is in southern Germany near to the French border. Um, you don't have to read the abstract. I'll show you the data in a little bit more condensed way. So it was, they reported on 101 patients, 53% were female, this was all adults. The design and that's the case for most of these post-marketing studies was retrospective. Um, they all had focal epilepsy. They were usually severely affected, and you can deduct that from the fact that they had already failed a median of 10 anti-seizure medications before rivaracetam was tried, so a highly refractory population. Starting dose in the hands of Bernhard Steinhoff was 50 milligrams per day, so two times 25 milligrams, sometimes a little bit higher. And the maintenance dose he reported was on average 169 milligrams per day. The median was 200. The range was between 50 and 400 milligrams. And 14 patients actually had more than 200 milligrams, which is, however, out of label. So I have to make you aware that this is not the normal use, but it's obviously out of label. And the switch from levetiracetam to brivaracetam occurred in 43% of these patients, so in 43 patients. And the ratio they switched by was 20 to 1 um, uh, until 15 to 1 in between. We switched a little different, I'll tell you later on. Um, they had an increased seizure frequency in 5, which is 11%. So it, it appeared to be less efficacious as compared to levetiracetam in these 10%. But the others, I'll show you what happened. Efficacy, 50% responders. So that's a group of patients that have a 50% reduction in seizure frequency after brivaracetam was introduced. That happened in 28%. And um, thereof, 7% were actually seizure free during the, um, during the observation time. And that was six months. Retention rate was 52%. So half of them dropped out, but 52% in this severely refractory population continued to take the drug for um, at least six months. Those who discontinued, discontinued for lack of efficacy. And in three patients also for side effects and in the rest, we don't know. Vertigo was, pre was present and prominent. Somnolence was present and some reported ataxia. So five patients reported ataxia. And I mentioned before that psychobehavioral side effects can occur and they observed irritability in 4%, depression in 2%, and two patients actually developed a psychosis, which is something that can happen with racetam drugs. Now, this is the post-marketing study two that's our experience. Isabel Steinig from is a do, did her doctoral thesis on this. And Adam Strelzig, uh, who's my chief medical um, um, staff, 
um, was actually the one organizing this. So we reported um, at the time, it was also, um, I think, uh, 2018 or so. Um, we reported on 262 patients, so a little bit higher group. 51% again women age 5 to 81 years. So at this time, it wasn't even approved in kids, but we used it a little bit in kids and we used it in the elderly. The design in this case was multi center. We included patients from Frankfurt, from Greifswald in northern Germany, and from Münster also in northern Germany. 83% had focal epilepsy, 7% had a generalized genetic epilepsy, and that is new, and that is also, the drug is not approved for this, for this um, group of patients, so I have to make you aware. And the prior anti-seizure medication use was an average of 6.8 and median of 6, so they had failed six drugs, so the um, collective is a little bit less refractory as compared to what Bernard Steinhoff did in Cork. Starting dose was again 50 milligrams per day. Um, if there was no switch, so if you actually started it anew and didn't reduce levetiracetam at the same time. And there was 51%, so half of the patients who received um, rivaracetam at that early stage in the post marketing use um, were switched from levetiracetam. And we used the ratio um, from 10 to 1 um, if the levetiracetam dose was higher than 2000. We sometimes used a little bit higher dose um, if it was um, uh, uh, sorry, if it was smaller than 2,000. The higher higher ratio if it was more than 2,000 in order to usually be able to stay within the maximum allowed dose of two times 100 milligrams. Um, maintenance dose, interestingly, the average was the same as with Bernard Steinhoff. The median was 200. The range was 50 to 400. And 27 of these patients, of these 260 patients, so about 10 percent received more than 200 milligrams. So we do use more than 200 when we think it's clinically necessary that the patient don't have any side effects. Again, addressing the ratio of switching, it's also a little bit when the patient on the left has a very good efficacy, but doesn't tolerate it so well, then we use rather this switch 15 to one. The patient needs a bit more efficacy and, and doesn't have, um, have um, Problems with tolerability, we use more the 10 to 1. So, this is our retention from the study. After three months, 79% were still in the trial. You see that um, um, this is 12 months here, actually. You can see that up here. After um, six months, we had 76% still in the trial. So, that's here. So, six months here, um, and uh, three months was here. And 12% discontinued due to lack of efficacy, and 9% discontinued to adverse events. The others we don't know. We also looked, did it make a difference if they were switched from left, that is the orange thing here, or if they just received it as an add-on? And in the switch, we used much higher doses to begin with, so we have a little bit more dropouts because of side effects, whereas if you start slowly, the drop-off is also slowly. But as you can see, it's no really, there was no really a difference. Um, so efficacy, 50% responders, 41%. So 31% of our patients had 50% seizure reduction or more. And actually 15% were seizure free for this for the study duration. Side effects again, somnolence, vertigo, headache. We had some psychobehavioral adverse events with depression in 9%. So that's a little bit higher than for Bernard Stanov. Irritability in 4%, that was the same. And aggressiveness, which is something that you don't really want, obviously, in 4% of the patients. And I think many of these were dropped out and stopped taking the time. Um, we looked a little bit at the switch group. So somnolence, tiredness, and so on, improved in 17 of 24 patients that reported tired, tiredness under levetiracetam. So 71% of those who said, I'm quite tired under levetiracetam, improved and 8%, two out of 24, actually um, worsened a little bit. So somnolence gets better usually when you switch from left to brief. The psychobehavioral side effects uh, were actually improved in 57%. So one of the reasons why we switch is that patients have efficacy on the left, but they don't tolerate it so well because they are irritable, aggressive, or depressive. And then we switch it to brief rather rapidly, from usually from one day to the other, I tell you later. And then 20 out of 35, where this was done, improved, and only two 
of certified worsened regarding their psychobehavioral side effects. So you have to be aware that this can happen, but usually they get better in both domains, somnolence and irritability and aggression. We then asked the question, does um, the presence of psychobehavioral side effects under LEV, um, does that predict the, pre the, the occurrence of psychobehavioral side effects under BRIF? You see, this is meant to be 100 patients. And these are the ones that have psychobehavioral side effects. These have no psychobehavioral side effects. And now see what happened. It was actually significantly so that the patients who had psychobehavioral side effects under, under LEV did also develop such side effects under RIF, but you can see it's only 23%. Um, whereas we observed such side effects in only 8% of those patients who did not have any psychobehavioral side effects under LEV. So that is significantly predictive. Then there's another paper, and there's now more papers. There's a big one from Spain, which is basically um, repeats the same data. This one is from Marburg, an epilepsy center where I used to work for a while. And um, what did they do? They had 93 patients, 38% were female. It was in monocenter trial, it was again retrospective. Most of them had focal epilepsy, some had generalized genetic epilepsies. Again, they had an average of 6.3 in the median of, uh, of five drugs that they had failed before. And the, the maintenance dose was in the median was 100 milligrams. So it was somewhat lower as, as reported to, to you before, where the median was 150 or 200, and the, the mean was 169. Switch again, the 51% of the patients were switched. And they didn't report the ratio, how they did it, and they didn't really report side effects, but they said the switch was unproblematic. Um, efficacy, 50% responders against 35%, which is a little bit less than we and Steinhoff reported, and they're of seizure-free 9%, so somewhere in the middle. Retention um, was 72% um, at the end of their study, so the average follow-up was 5.3 months, so similar to what we reported. 15% discontinued to lack of efficacy and 20% for adverse events. Um, side effects, somnolence in 8%, cognitive problems in 7%, vertigo in 3%, psychobehavioral side effects, irritability, depression, aggressiveness. So about similar to what we have seen, maybe a little bit higher, even though they use a little bit lower dose. Um, then they looked at the groups, those that, that had adverse events under levetiracetam, um, that was 21% in the past and 36% at the time when they switched from lev to brief. And they again reported an improvement or no new occurrence of, of, of such side effects um, after the switch. Um, so even in those who had, who had that in the past or at baseline, 77% didn't have problems with the new drug. This kind of um, um, takes it together. Uh, sorry, I'm, uh, some of this is, no, this is all good. Some of the, mis the some is studying mistake here should be a C. Steinhoff 2017, Steinig, which is from our place, 2017, and then Zana 2018. Patient number you've seen, retrospective monocenter or multicenter, retrospective monocenter. The number of drugs failed, so the most refractory population is here. Steinhoff, we are in the middle. Um, switch from left to BRIF in, in about half of the patients. Um, this is the ratios used, and I mentioned it to you, and most, and most patients, uh, Responder rates were quite good, most improved. In, the deterioration was only reported by Steinhoff. 50% responders, 28%, 41%, 35%. So let's say 30 to 40%. Seizure free, for, sorry for not translating, seizure free 7, 15, and 9%. So again, 10% became, became seizure free for six to 12 months, and depending how long the study was. Retention rates, you can see here, quite okay. Um, 52 versus 76 percent. Bernard Steinhoff is when he doesn't think a drug has a response, he rather quickly takes it off again. So that explains why he had a little bit lower retention. And the side effects are these that you can expect: a little bit depression, somnolence, vertigo, irritability. So let's look have a look after this most important data on a little bit on pa special patient groups that, in which it was used. This is a paper from um, Bavaria, 
the Free State of Bavaria in the southeast of Germany around Munich. Um, and it's a, a place called Rummelsberg, and they looked in their patients with intellectual disability treated with brivaracetam. It's not a big cohort, just 33 patients, but it's important because there are some many patients that have epilepsy and have a little bit of disability, and you want to know whether they can use it in that group. Again, nearly half were female, the age was 17 to 63, monocenter retrospective, adults with cognitive disability. They had a minimum of six anti-seizure medications in the past. Currently, they were taking a median of three anti-seizure medications, and then brivaracetam was added. Um, some had obsessive compulsive disorders, we had affective disorders, two had psychoses, two had autism spectrum disorders. So these things that are comorbid in a patient with severe epilepsy and cognitive handicap. Um, in eight patients, they switched left to brief, and the other ones it was just um, added. And the dose they aimed for in responders, so they had a feeling it gets better, then they would aim for 200 milligrams as the maximum dose. They had some 50% responders, 20%, 28%, sorry, after six months. Nobody became seizure free in this um, difficult population. After 12 months, they still had 19%, so about a fifth that were 50% responders. Retention was somewhat lower as reported before, 56% after six months and 37% after 12 months. Adverse behavioral changes actually occurred in 40% of the patients, so in 13 out of the 32. And nine of these 13 patients had psychiatric comorbidity. And in eight of the 33 patients, brivacetam had to be discontinued for these problems. We have a little bit of experience in, in generalized genetic epilepsy. I mentioned that, and we got together a bunch of such patients from um, different centers, Berlin, Frankfurt, Greifswald, Cork, Marburg, Münster, Neuropin, the German names of the cities. 61 patients, 67% um, were female, age was nine to 90 years. Um, 26% had juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, 7% had childhood absence epilepsy, and 59% had other less well-defined genetic generalized epilepsies. They had used um, 4.3 anti-seizure medications previously. 50% were on levetiracetam when we started. Lamotrigine was um, seen and was given to 36%. Valproic acid, 28%, and to pyromate, 16%. About half of them were switched. The maintenance dose was 180 milligrams on average, median 200 range, and 50 to um, 400 milligrams. Retention, 82% after three months in this population, where it's not even approved for, 69% after six months and 52 after 12 months. And you see that here. And again, switch or no switch doesn't make too much of a difference. Efficacy. 36% of 50% responders, they're of seizure-free 25%. I have to mention that this includes some patients who were seizure-free before the switch, but were switched only for adverse effects. I think two, two of these patients were switched for adverse effects only and um, yeah, had good, good efficacy before the switch. Um, after six months, um, seizure-free 18%. After 12 months, seizure-free, 16%, and responderoids go a little bit down over time. Now, what can we say about the differential effect in these subpopulations? And our impression was that juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, which is frequently not so easy to treat, actually the best drug to be treated with brivaracetam from these GGE syndromes. So 60% were responders and 40% were, were, became or remained seizure-free. As I mentioned, some of these had been seizure-free under levetiracetam before. So that seems to be a relatively good indication. Whereas um, childhood absence epilepsy in Jevon syndrome, small numbers, so be aware only small numbers, we didn't have any responders. So it may not be such a good drug for absence epilepsy or Jevon syndrome. And when patients had already were already treated with valproic acid and this was and brivaracetam was added. We didn't see um, we didn't see good effect. Um, so adverse events, somnolence, irritability, depression, the same as we reported for the focal population. Now let's look a little bit on use in status epilepticus and and um, seizure emergency situations. 
And for to do that, we, we compared, and this is again a slide I owe to Adam Strelzig, my, my chief staff physician. Um, we looked at comparing different IV drugs uh, regarding their characteristics. Do they cause respiratory or circulatory depression? Do they have an effect on vigilance? What are the interactions? What's the half time? What is the drug monitoring and the levels? Do we need to do that? How is tissue toxicity? If you inject it paravenously, what happens? And um, is it tested as a, is an infusion solution tested in patients? And you see green is good, gray is not so good. And you see that the benzodiazepines have some good properties. They do sedate. They have, they are respiratory depressing. And with the newer ones, and val valproic acid and the newer ones, levetiracetam, lacosamide, and rivaracetam, you don't see much of circulatory or respiratory depression. Um, you have few interactions. You have these half-lives. You, you don't really need to do drug monitoring. And tissue toxicity is quite low. So there are, there are some um, data on such epilepticals. And again, I need to mention here, Rivarastam is not approved for status epilepticus treatment, but we have used it a little bit. And you see, this is a total of 11 plus 7 is 19 plus 2 is 21. And so it's very little experience. Just to tell you that it seems to be possible to use it. It was used in patients who had quite refractory status epilepticus. It was also used in two patients with generalized uh, genetic epilepsy in absence status. Efficacy was okay when the refractory um, patients was the last drug given in 38%, so three out of eight in the super refractory didn't have any effects. Um, here we had CALS had a little bit higher response rate, four out of seven, and um, in the absence status, there was no response again, as I mentioned. So absence doesn't seem to be the ideal indication. I was asked to talk a little bit to you about a case study and to illustrate how we actually do use the drug. So this is a patient, I just saw the discharge letter. So he is born in, 19, in 1987, actually in Syria, he is a refugee. So he didn't see too many drugs previously and hasn't been getting too much um, diagnostic procedures before. He comes now for pre-surgical monitoring because he has daily seizures since the age of one. Etiology is unknown. We labeled him as, or he was labeled atypical lennox gastaut syndrome, so multiple seizure types. He has a right arm paresis, and he was, when he came to the, to the office, he had, was taking levetiracetam, 2,000 milligrams BID, so more than the allowed maximum dose. He was taking lacosamide, 100 milligrams BID, and he was taking also valproic acid, 1,000 milligrams BID, so quite high doses, um, especially for the first and the last of these three drugs, and three drugs at the same time, still having seizures. So during the monitoring, we reduced the left rest time a little bit to get more seizures. The rest remained unchanged. We recorded eight seizures, which is enough. And then, um, um, sorry, most of, most were coming from the came from the left from the right hemisphere, not left, but came from the right hemisphere. Um, this he was discharged on Brief 200, so we just did the switch. And we do that relatively rapidly, oftentimes from one day to the other. So we reduced him. And when we restarted, instead of restarting levetiracetam, we took it off completely and started brivracetam. And then after three days, discharged him home under, under brivracetam two times, 200 milligrams. And this one unchanged. Valproic acid was reduced a little bit because he had um, some thrombocytopenia and relatively high drug levels. We, um, in the letter, it also says epidiolex, so cannabidiol. Um, could be considered because of the atypical lennox syndrome if he's not effective, if the drugs are not effective now. He works for epilepsy surgery case conference. So to conclude this a little bit, what is my impression how this drug works and how it can be used? It's the younger sister of levetiracetam. Tablets are smaller um, and the, it's, it's, the, um, the tolerability is better. It has higher um, um, affinity to the, to the synaptic vesicle 2A protein. It goes faster to the brain, so brain entry is quicker. It has, in my eyes, about the same efficacy, but better tolerability, so you can ramp up the dose a little bit, and, and then you actually get better efficacy also. And you see that's occurred in about 
30 to 30 percent of the cases we had better better efficacy also but in general clinical use i would tell the patients uh, especially if they come with side effects with level racetam i say listen we you have some efficacy we can use a drug that's better tolerated and equally efficacious maybe we can ramp the dose up once we have switched you and can see whether this will help you a little bit and it does so again patients that have this is probably one of the biggest groups that have efficacy under levetiracetam but do have psychobehavioral uh, adverse events or tiredness they are switched one example would be and that's what i'm usually doing most patients unless they are complaining that they usually have a lot of side effects i um they have levetiracetam let's say 1500 in the morning 1500 in the evening on day two i just switch the evening levetiracetam to brief 100 ratio 15 to 1 um, and left as, as morning dose is the same. And on the, the next day, I give them rivaracetam two times 100 milligrams. And that usually works quite nicely. In the team, we had a guy who was, who was a little bit more cautious, who's now a professor in, in, for epilepsy in Calgary, Canada, Karma Klein. He used um, ramping up, ramping down, and he didn't, he didn't really. Um, um, have any better experience than we than the other people in the team so i don't think it's necessary to do that you can do that with cautious patients or if you are very cautious yourself but you don't need to do that contra it has a little bit more interactions um, especially the carbamazepine epoxide can rise as i mentioned before um, the pro pros i just mentioned and um, as i mentioned also we use it in jme also quite a bit especially if patients uh, have been stopping to have general tonic clonic seizures under levetiracetam, but they have a lot of psychobehavioral side effects and we use it in JME to switch over again. But again, it's not approved for generalized genetic epilepsies, which I keep mentioning here for you. Summary, we have good tolerability and retention, 60 to 70% after six months, sometimes a little bit less. 50% seizure reduction in the clinical practice is 28 to 41% after six months or so, which is relatively similar to the data from the um, randomized controlled trials I showed you initially. Seizure freedom was achieved in 7 to 50% of the patients in post-marketing studies. Very few patients have a little bit more seizures than they used to have, so it's about less than 10% or 10%. The switch from left to brief is usually well tolerated and is a good use a good reason to use brivaracetam ratio is one to ten rarely 15 uh, 10 to one so 10 left to one brief or 15 left to one brief um for instance 1500 1500 200 100 would be something typical um improvement of psychobehavioral adverse events following the switch from left to brief is observed in about 60 percent of cases um, it is a therapy, therapy option in patients with disabilities. It's a little bit less efficacious in this difficult population, and some have to stop it because of um, psychobehavioral adverse events in this population. And it works in general genetic epilepsies, mainly in um, juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, not so much in absence. We didn't, we didn't observe any efficacy. Um, there's very limited data on use in status epilepticus. It gets faster to the brain. That's one of the ideas why one might want to use it, but it's not approved. It's not recommended by German guidelines as of yet because we really don't have much experience. And we can't say too much. And if you are really interested in this drug, we have written a, in the Engel textbook, this big textbook. Um, um, Basel, Abu Khalil, and myself have written the the book chapter, the book is not out yet, but you will then be able to inform yourself, yourself comprehensively about this drug as soon as it comes out, which is probably going to be at the end of the year or so. So thank you very much. And I'm certainly open for questions. This is our epilepsy center with the sky high, high risers that we have in Frankfurt at the Spike and Lift complex. And you know, you see here where we have it from, you see. This is one of them. This is the mind tower. This is actually our church, which is about, which is about a thousand years old and was the place for the coronation of many German kings or Kaisers, as they called them down there. And this is the banking district of Frankfurt with our river at night. Thank you.
फक्त दे जाय थँक यू डॉक्टर रोजनो दॅट वॉज रिअली व्हेरी व्हेरी कन्साइज अँड फुल ऑफ इन्साइट नॉलेज इन्फॉर्मेशन and very very wonderfully summarized in the last two or three slides so i think a lot of questions that were raised by the audience some of them have been answered by uh, the two summary slides that you showed um but there are a few which uh, deem answering and uh, a, a reversal from you and your experience so one of the key questions is do you think brevaracetam is safe with all anti convulsants or would you be cautious with some uh, co medications in patients with epilepsy yeah the the one thing i think that may be most relevant in clinical practice especially if you use a lot of carbamazepine is this rise in the epoxy side which can result right. in quite a bit of side effects so be aware with carbamazepine um, epoxy side may rise you might take to might make need to take epoxy side levels Right. the other thing that was mentioned in a very small cohort that is that there seem to be some interaction with epidiolex with with rivaracetam dr klotz and colleagues have written up that there is can be uh, marked changes in the in the in the levels of rivaracetam uh, with epidiolex so that you have to be aware i don't know whether epidiolex um, so n n endocannabidiol is it's not uh, a very good is approved not approved no, so then it's then it's not a problem for you as of yet yeah. but if you have and, patient that use, and use do you have any concerns drug. about oxcarbazepine uh, just like carbamazepine do you have any concerns with oxcarb there's a lot of oxcarb uh, being mm-hmm. used in india for patients no, with focal onset much, epilepsy that in general i think the combination of a sodium channel blocker with sv2a ligand is a good idea um we also use oxcarbazepine quite a bit you don't have this epoxide problem and you don't have any clinically relevant side effects or interactions so that's a combination that can um be used wonderful and it's probably a good combination great one of the other questions that has come up is uh, do you think brevaracetam could be uh, used for patients who are beyond 65 years of age with scar epilepsy and with elderly epilepsy Yeah, we have in Germany we have a little bit of a habit of giving many of these elderly patients levetiracetam even though I think data suggests that lamotrigine might be better but it's frequently stroke patients you want them out of the hospital soon so you give them something that works quickly and similar to levetiracetam with brivaracetam you can achieve effective doses from day 1 on so if you give two times 25 or two times 50 mg you already have an effective dose from the first day on it's um there's not so much concern about the cardiac conduction that you may have with sodium channel blockers if you want to start them fast so i think that's a good option to do that and they will probably have less psychobehavioral side effects and less tiredness with brivaracetam on the other hand it's not approved for monotherapy yet so we will still be using levetiracetam or if we if we are in if we are in need of a fast drug response or lamotrigine if we are need, if we have a little bit more time and only when once it's approved as an as a monotherapy then we will probably use it more in the elderly as well great um the someone has asked is there a need for liver function test before prescribing brivaracetam i don't do that i do very little blood testing anyways and i don't do levels also so i just use it and look up to the clinical effect um Yeah, I haven't experienced any liver function problems. Um I know that with levetiracetam there can be interstitial nephritis, but I'm not aware that we have observed this with brivaracetam at all. So, yeah, we use only a tenth of the dose and I don't think there are many there are many problems. But any you, you do have any views on brivaracetam and pregnancy or in women of childbearing age group? we don't know anything so if somebody if, if a female patient is on brivaracetam and she wants she says i want to be now become pregnant and maybe that she takes brivaracetam and lamotrigine then we would advise to switch back to levetiracetam if she tolerated it or use something else maybe oxcarbamazepin if it's if it wasn't tolerated but in that case we would switch back because there's no sufficient data on brif and pregnancy right now and that took many years for levetiracetam and we are quite happy that we can now use uh, levetiracetam and lamotrigine and oxcarbazepin 
quite confidentially and so we wouldn't we wouldn't use it in pregnancy wonderful so that's that's a very clear straight no um uh, is, is there any patient profile that you think uh, is a typical profile where you would not hesitate to use brevacetam is there any kind of patient profile or is it uh... as, a, as i mentioned one of the main indications because in germany uh, actually levetiracetam is the most used antiepileptic drug out of all drugs and a substantial proportion of these patients have some problems with irritability depression aggression and those are the, the perfect patients to if they have efficacy to switch them over to brif so that's probably what we did a lot and you've seen 50% were actually switched and otherwise, maybe someone who has has a sodium channel blocker and is not quite seizure free, you can then add, let, let's let say, say he has um, oxcarbazepine, and then you could, I think, add rivaracetam or levetiracetam, or try to switch levetiracetam, see how he, how whether he side effects, and if that doesn't do the job, you do rivaracetam. So, sodium channel blocker plus, and obviously, as it has a little bit more interaction potential as compared to the to, to levetiracetam, it's, it's nicer in patients that don't have a lot of drug load, but it doesn't really influence me clinically in everyday practice very much. Great. Yeah. So I think many, many of the questions that have been raised have been answered by you very elegantly. Uh, Zishan, are there other questions? Uh, do you, you have access to the chat box? No, sir. These were the only questions. Great, wonderful. Then um, I think I can hand over to Dr. Preeti again. Yeah. yeah. It was a great pleasure being here. Uh, yeah. So thank you so much, sir. Uh, it was a wonderful and insightful uh, presentation. Uh, also, we learned a lot from your side. So uh, I would also like to inform uh, the on the upcoming webinar on this uh, tackling the behavioral issues with uh, AED. So uh, with uh, Dr. Uh, this. Uh, S. Menakshi Sundaram, with, uh, along with the Dr. Sangeeta Rawat on 7th April. So uh, I would extend my thanks to uh, Dr. Felix Rosino sir, and uh, Dr. Joy Desai sir, for a wonderful, insightful discussion and uh, for your time also. I would also like to thank the audience for their time and patient listening. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you very thank much. You. Thank, thank, thank you, Dr. Bye-bye. Wonderful. Enjoy bye -bye. the rest of the evening in India. Yeah.